think about, the God that, that maybe he's, you know, he's not perfect, he's not all-powerful, he's not all-knowing, he's not ever-present. And so that's one of the issues that comes up when you come to Daniel chapter 11. But let's back up just for a moment. Would you not agree with me that we are living in an age of rebellion? Now, when you think about this, 2,500 years ago, when Daniel wrote all of this down for us, and yet 2,500 years ago, that was an age of rebellion because you've got all these nations. You've got Persia. You've got the north and the south kings in a moment. We're going to talk about that. You've got all this war going on all around the nation of Israel. And Israel sometimes because you've, you've got the, the Syrians and you've got those coming out of Egypt. And they, whenever they fight each other, guess where they meet? They meet in the land of Israel. So Israel, the land of Israel stays decimated for just a number of years. You've heard of the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. Well, this is what's going on. You've got all of this stuff going on. And Daniel, I mean, not Daniel, but Israel is paying the price for this. But there's another reason behind all this, too. In the 11th chapter of Daniel, he chronicles the reign of rebellion upon the earth as man continues to defy God. What we see going on in the streets, what we hear, what we watch, it all boils down to one thing. Man does not have a relationship with God. Man is sinful. Man needs a new nature. And mankind will never be right. The human race will never be right until they come and meet the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we say that. That is our banter. That is our soapbox. That's where we stand. That's what the Bible teaches. And we believe that, and we know that by experience. But why is it so hard for the world outside of these four walls? Why is it so hard for them to connect with that? Is it because the church is not? Well, that might be part of it. But you know what it is? Because mankind is at large, it is in total rebellion against God. Why do you think that as we move past the rapture of the church, seven years of tribulation, then we have even the second coming of Jesus, Armageddon, even after that, the thousand-year millennial reign, do you realize that there's going to be a rebellion that's going to come about? You go to Revelation 20 and read the first four or five verses. Another, uh, after all of that, tribulation, Armageddon, thousand-year millennial reign, there is still going to be a rebellion after Satan is loose from the bottomless pit for a short time. But man still has that rebellious nature. We're all born with it. David said in Psalm 51, he says, I, I, was, I was born, he said, I was birthed in iniquity. He said, I was born a sinner. I was born a sinner. Scripture tells us that the time of man's rebellion will continue until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the, you know, the great white throne. We've got all this going on, and still man is going to rebel, still. But within the larger picture of all of this rebellion against God, we have Israel's rebellion. Now, why is that so significant? Because in the Old Testament, Israel was called by God as a nation of chosen people. A lot of people don't like to say that. The Jews are the chosen. Well, yeah, they are. Biblically, they are. However, even though they are chosen, they have disobeyed God repeatedly. By being idolatrous and living in immorality, they continue to defy God and they spurned his loving kindness and his grace. Consequently, God continues to discipline the nation of Israel for their sin, for their sin. So, David, is that fair? Well, listen as we go through this. To, in order to understand the disciplining of Israel's rebellion, if you don't grasp that, then you'll never understand the prophecy of what Daniel 11 is all about. Jeremiah the prophet declared that Israel would go into captivity for 70 years. And after realizing the 70 years had come to an end, Daniel was expecting that the land of Israel would be restored and that the city of Jerusalem and its temple would be rebuilt after those in captivity returned to the land. Now, all of this is going to take place. 70 years is up. They're going to be allowed to go back. Uh, Cyrus is going to have a lot to do with this. He's going to let them go back to, to Jerusalem, they get to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. Ezra, the temple, Nehemiah, the walls and the gates. And so Daniel's expecting all of this to happen, but it didn't happen. You say, why? Listen, only a small remnant went back, 46,000 plus people. The city remained in ruins and the nation was nothing significant at all. So Daniel I mean, he's incredibly disappointed. He had been praying for this three times a day, by the way, that God would allow them to go back and all the Jews that were in captivity and exile, 
they could go back to their homeland and they could rebuild what has been destroyed because of their sin, because of their idolatry, because of their immorality. Daniel, oh, we, we studied this earlier, he confesses his own sin, he confesses the sins of his fathers, he confesses the sins of the people, and he's asking God, you know, to let them go back, and then he reads in the book of Jeremiah, because he had a copy of it, 70 years is coming to an end, and now we can go back to our land. And say you've got a couple of million people in exile, and all of a sudden only 42,000 want to go back, or 46,000 want to go back. That broke Daniel's heart. Who wouldn't want to go back? You're Jewish. This, here's your roots. But what happened? The Jewish people did not respond to the discipline of God. That's why they were in exile. You know, it's like over in Psalm 106. They got short memories. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you for taking care of us here in Babylon. Lord, you, you allowed us to set up businesses. Lord, we found favor with, you know, with the kings. God, you've been so good to us. Thank you and praise you. And then they forgot everything that they had known, everything that they had experienced. They forgot their history. They forgot their heritage. The Jewish people did not respond to the discipline. Well, how do you know? Because the majority of them stayed in Babylon. They had become so comfortable in Babylon, they didn't want to go back. They didn't want to, go, they didn't want to be Jewish anymore. Now, how does that affect the church today? How many... People come to church on Sunday, and they do what Psalm 106 talks about. You know how that, they remembered what God had done, and they're so grateful and thankful. And then when they leave, and they go out, and they get back in the world, and they go back to work, they forget all that they had learned, all that they had experienced. They forget all the blessings of God. It's almost like, okay, God, I'm going to take you out now, and I'm going to put you over here. I'll pick you up next Sunday. Does that happen in our day? Absolutely. So how do you know that? Because the church literally is anemic when we get outside these four walls the church is weak the church is not strong the church is not as bold now in here in numbers i mean man we can just set up a raucous we can sing loud we can praise god we are bold and all this here but for some reason when we get out there all of a sudden we just kind of lose our fire most of the people went back did not go back because they were too comfortable in babylon listen and they were not interested in returning to the broken down land that they had left so, this was not the end of their disciplining, it was only the beginning. Really? Yeah, because when you come to Daniel chapter 10, all the way through chapter 12, the last three chapters, it, is, it has nothing really to do with us, the church, but it has to do all with the nation of Israel. And that God is going to continue to allow them. Now, remember, he gave them the promised land from the Euphrates all the way down, literally, to almost Egypt. God has given them, that's the promised land. And God's going to allow these nations to rule and reign. They're going to change out the kings. That's what chapter 11 is all about. And they're going to have all of these wars and battles. And guess who's sitting in the middle of it? Guess who's, who's not going to, the promised land is not going to be restored. Why? Because the people didn't want it. And so God says, okay, I'm not going to give it to you. So what about the remnant? Oh, they're, the remnant always going to pay the price for the majority. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When and if that time comes and persecution begins... Say here in the United States, as it is around other, when they start monitoring what we say, um, you know, I know tonight, you know, YouTube could come in and they could cut us off because, you know, I, I may say something that's offensive, that's not healthy for the community. You know, I've seen those little tags on some things. You know, I get that. You say, well, that's not fair. We have First Amendment rights. Well, yeah, but then, you know, we're not YouTube and we're not this and we're not that. And how are we going to communicate? Okay, we're going to preach. Do you know up in Canada, if you say anything about a homosexual, if you say anything about the, the, a government official, if you say anything and, and you really come down hard on any kind of immoral sin, you know that that pastor can be arrested for hate speech? And, that, and Canada's not that far away. You say, oh, they're not doing that up there. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. What's happening is, is the church going to conform? Is the church going to stand? Are the pastors going to continue to be bold? Are they going to preach God's word? Or are they going to sort of just give in and kind of go along? In China, if you're a pastor of a government church, then what happens is every week, could you imagine this? Every week I'd have to take my sermon and I'd have to hand it to a, a government official and he goes through it and he deletes stuff and blocks out stuff and that's all I can do on Sunday is what is before me. And because they'll have people out there and he's got the same thing I've got and I'm reading my sermon and if I get off of any way, any way, and I, I, and I say anything negative or anything that's not in here, then guess what? I get arrested. 
You say, that's happening. It's folks, it's coming, it's happening. And I understand that. You say, well, are you worried about it? Not really, because I think the Lord Jesus is going to take care of all of us. And then eventually the rapture is going to come and the world's going to get what they want. They want a world without God. And that's going to happen. That is going to happen. They're going to have a world without God. So Daniel comes and all that he expected, the people would be excited about going back to Israel. Well, it didn't happen. So Daniel, instead of whining about it, he begins to pray. So he gets on his knees and he prays to God. And in effect... He asked God hard questions. And by the way, God's not afraid of these. Why haven't things worked out like I thought they would? I, I'm, I'm obeying you. I'm trusting you. I'm praying. I found Jeremiah's prophecy and the people are going back. They don't want to go back. Why haven't all the people returned? Why isn't the city being rebuilt and the temple restored? Why isn't the glorious land of God's people becoming what it used to be? And finally, after praying for three weeks, the answer came in the form of the prophecy of chapters 11 and 12. The message was that since the disciplining of Israel was going to continue until the time of complete restoration, Israel is going to continue to be disciplined until the Messiah arrives to establish his kingdom. Israel's 70 years of captivity is only the beginning. You say, but is, is that what God... Listen... God will prophesy. He said, I will give you the promised land. Genesis 12, you could go all the way back there. God says, I will give you this, Abraham, and your people will multiply. And those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. Well, you know what happened after Abraham? And let's fast forward. All of a sudden now, the nation of Israel is the nations that were cursing them. Now the nation of Israel has literally gotten in bed with those nations. And so instead of being a blessing to the world, they become a curse to God. And that's what happened to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel at large has literally turned their backs on God. But God is going to keep his word. And I'm going to show you that tonight as we go through this. God is going to keep his word to the nation of Israel. Now, when I say the nation of Israel, you can't think of individuals. You've got to think of the whole nation. When you think of the church, when I say Crescent Beach Baptist Church, you've got to think of the, 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 the church of Christ, the universal church of Christ, the true church of Christ. That, that's, that's the bride of Christ. That's what's going up in the rapture of the church, the, tr the true church of Christ, the bride. So the discipline of Israel is going to continue all the way through until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. Now, when is that? That's the millennial reign. You say, well, man, all right, let's stop a moment. We've talked about tribulation. What is the tribulation about? The tribulation it's, it's, it's two prongs. One of the prongs, it's, it's on the nation of Israel. Why? God is still judging them because of their idolatry, because of their immorality. He said, David, you sound like they're a terrible nation. Listen, when you think about the, the law, you think about the orthodoxy and all of these things that they are hanging on to, you think about the, the fact that they're keeping the law and they're going to rebuild the temple during the, the, the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to let them do this. They are still stuck on the law. Jesus came in the Gospels to do what? He came, he fulfilled the law. The Messiah that they are looking for today has already come 2,000 years ago. And they refuse to admit that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Why? Just like in the first century. He was not what they expected. He was not what they wanted. They wanted someone to come in and take out the Romans. They wanted someone to come in and deal with all the oppression. Jesus did not. Jesus came to do what? To set them free from their sin. They had, there had to be a sacrifice. They have a sin nature. And so, listen, the Orthodox Jews, they do not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Why? They reject him. They won't even read the New Testament. You try to explain Isaiah 53 to them, and they don't, they're not real happy about that. Because he said, well, yes, that's talking to the Messiah. But they say he hasn't come yet. I'm thinking, he has come. The Messiah has come. But you see, their orthodoxy and their legalism and the fact of tradition, they're holding on to the law. Now, that's Israel. And the tribulation is going to be what? God's, he's, he's going to continue to discipline them. He's going to show them that the law will not save them and the law cannot protect them. Why did God give us the law? He gave us the law to expose our sinfulness. That's why he gave us the law. As long as you live within the law, let's say the Ten Commandments, you can still have fellowship with God. But you break one of those laws, Jesus said if you've broken one, you broke all of them. So that the Orthodox Jews, they are, they are struggling with the fact that, no, that Jesus Christ is not the Messiah they were expecting. So they just ignore him. They reject him. 
when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me, that doesn't bother them because they don't believe it. You and I embrace that. Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All the world, all the human race. So, two prong. So the Jews are going to continue to be disciplined. Why? God is he's going to discipline them. And by the way, you can go to Romans, I believe it's eleven twenty six, and it says, In one day all of Israel will be saved. When will that happen? When Jesus comes in the second coming, the remnant of Israel that's left, because the nations of the world are going to come together to destroy Israel. And the Bible says that in, Re in Revelation 19, the church is coming back with Jesus, the bride of Christ. And when they see Christ, when they look up, they're going to see him as the Messiah. And those who are alive in that day, at that time, in that moment, that's the Israel that's going to be saved. Because then they will finally at last see the Messiah. And they'll know that everything that they had rejected and, and disbelieved, now they can believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. God is going to keep his word. He is going to save the nation of Israel. Say, so well, what about the, the nation that's the same promise that God gave all the way back in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when it talks about the, the serpent's head is going to be bruised and, uh, and, uh, and is going to be bruised, and that the, the Son of Man, the Son of Eve, if you please, who would eventually be Jesus, that he would have a bruised heel. God's going to keep his word. So here we are in chapter 11, and Daniel, and we're just going to cover a couple of things. Daniel is, is going to help, he's going to be told by the angel of these things that are going to happen. And the things that happen in verses 2 through 4, I mean, we're talking about 300 years during the, the silent years between Malachi and, uh, and Matthew. It's amazing how that each one of them is going to take place. Now, I wrote in my notes that if you are a history buff, this will just fascinate you. You can dig in here. You can get you a, a decent commentary. and It will just guide you through and give you some names and information and dates. And it's just amazing how it all folds up. But if you're not a history buff, you're going to say, well, David, you know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take verses 2, 3, and 4, and I'm going to share with you just a couple of things. I'm not going to get into all this because there's lots of drama in here, by the way. There's all kinds of stuff going on. There's marriages between Syria and Egypt, and, you know, the, the Syrian gives his daughter. Her name is uh, Cleopatra. That's not the one in the movies. And so you've got all this stuff going on, and, and then dad dies, and there's, the whole family gets wiped out and murdered. I mean, all this drama. But we don't need drama tonight. I just want to show you again, verses 2, 3, and 4, that the Word of God is true. That God, as a professor in school taught me, Dr. David Lanier, that God can write a book, and it's not fake news, it's the real, real truth. So let's look together in chapter 11. And I have jumped all the way through this. Look with me in chapter 11, verse 2. And now I will tell you, this is the angel speaking to Daniel, now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. In Persia. The four kings. The first one is Cambyses. He's the son of Cyrus. We could go back to chapter 10, verse 1. It talks about Cyrus. So Cambyses is the son of Cyrus. This is around 537 B.C. History tells us that the second king is not, he's a pseudo smyrtus He's a usurper and imposter. What happened was this guy who was an imposter... He looked so much like Cambyses that he claimed to be the king, so he gained the throne through deception. So everybody thought Cambyses had died, but all of a sudden he shows up again and he looks healthy and well. Well, this was an imposter. So he was the second king. Remember now, there's four of them in verse 2. Then the third one, we have Darius Hatapses. He attacked Greece and he would be defeated. Now, why is that important? Back in Daniel, starting in chapter 2, we had the different visions. We have, uh, we have the, the bear, we have the goat. And we have the line, we have all of these different features. And then we have the, the, the statue, and, you know, of course, it's the Medes and the Persians. And then we have the, the silver chest with the arms. And, okay, so you have the Persians, and then you have the Greeks, you know, and then, it, I'm sorry, back, you have the Babylonians, you have the Persians, and then you have the Greeks. And so the, here's this, 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 all this history stuff's going on. Well, it's all documented in chapter 11. All of this, it's not just Bible stuff. It's not something we teach in Sunday school to the children. All of these things actually happened. The fourth king, if you read down with me, it says in verse 3, no, I'm sorry, verse 2, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all, than the other three, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Xerxes, he's also known as a hazardous, he was the king mentioned in the book of Esther. He was a great ruler and he was very wealthy. And he, he, he got this great army together. You're talking, you know, about three or 400,000 men. 
and he marches down on Greece and he attacks Greece and Greece defeats him so he comes back he's been defeated so look in verse 3 then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will now go back up to chapter 10 and look with me in verse 20 chapter 10 verse 20 here's the angel then he said do you not know why I have come to you and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia so Gabriel the angel is going to go back with Michael that's back up in verse 13 and they're going to continue to fight these other two fallen angels then he says do you not know why I've come to you he says and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia and when I have gone forth indeed the prince of Greece will come here's the picture and I got this from David Jeremiah and, and he's, he's, he's an incredible teacher he says that Satan knowing that what's going on with Israel watch me now what's going on in Israel is is that because he can read Jeremiah says that Jeremiah 25 that the nation can now is going to be set free by Cyrus and so this fallen angel he, he wants to do everything he can to stop that why is it that he doesn't want the nation of Israel to be able to go home why is he trying to just, just all this turmoil and discredit why is he making things accessible and comfortable for the Jews there in Babylon okay stop think about me when the Jews go back to Israel fast forward about um, five five hundred years and and what's going to happen in five hundred years after Daniel the birth of Christ and so Satan has his minions his fallen angels he's going to do everything he can to stop that from happening he doesn't want the birth of Christ why he's the Messiah he's the one that one day that Satan's going to be kicked out of heaven and he's going to be just put down on the earth and the prince of the power of the air and that's it then he's going to have his antichrist and, and we know all this revelation so the prince of Persia a fallen angel he is doing battle with Michael and Gabriel why because the news is is that okay the children of Israel are going back down to Israel and guess what Satan doesn't want that he doesn't want that's why there's such a small number comes because you know Satan and we're dealing with lost people here he can't oppress them we talked about this the other day he can come and and he can possess unbelievers and so he can rule and reign and so he's using these angels and so God sends his angels to break this up so that Daniel can get this message so Daniel can understand why the people aren't going back because there's a supernatural war that's going on above us in the heavenlies okay now back in verse 20 it talks about the Prince of Greece do you know it's almost like this and my, Jeremiah says this dr. Jeremiah each nation has its own personal fallen angel watching over it now that's gonna make people nervous you don't really believe that it's right there in the Bible you have the Prince of Greece you have the Prince of Persia the United States has its own fallen angel he, he has his his own why he's trying to suppress the church he's trying to do everything he can with you know he's, he's in the communications he's you know trying to do everything to block out to keep the gospel from going forth every nation has one of those and so when you look back down to verse 3 in chapter 11 then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will guess who that mighty king is if you know anything about history his name is Alexander Alexander the Great because what happens is watch verse 4 and when he has arisen his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven now it doesn't give a lot of information but it's given us a snapshot in 12 years Alexander the Great is going to conquer the world the known world from Egypt all the way to India he's going to conquer everything it is said that he was so distraught that he actually wept in his tent because there was not anything else that he could conquer At the age of 33 he would die so that's Alex Alexander the Great but watch what it says now the Bible is so so I mean just sufficient and when he has arisen his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven but not among his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others beside him listen Alexander was the son of Philip the second of Macedon when he came to fight against Egypt guess what nation he ran through on the way down south he ran right through Israel and, and just 
Whatever he needed, he got. If he needed food, he'd take it from the fields. If he needed slaves, he'd just take whatever he needed. Why? Because he was in that conquering mode. 200 years before Alexander was born, now watch, watch verse 11, 3. 200 years before he was born, Daniel had received this prophecy, which predicted that the Greek empire would be divided, not among his children, but to four others. Verse 4 says, and it would be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. And not of his children. His four generals would take his kingdom. They would divide it, and they would fight. And then they ended up one in the south and one in the north, and I'll talk about that in a moment. See, Alexander had a half-brother who was mentally retarded. He had an illegitimate son, and he had a baby born after he had died. All were murdered to prevent his posterity from having claim to the throne. So then these four generals, they, they get together, and, and, and after the battle, four of them rose to the top. One by the name of Cassander, he took Macedonian Greece. Lysimachus took Thrace and Asia Minor. Ptolemy took Egypt in the south, and Seleucus took Syria to the north. So Ptolemy and Seleucus, they ended up being the two strongest dynasties. So, and we had the time we could go from verses 5 through 20, and there would be 200 years of war wars raised between the south and the north from Egypt and Syria and guess where they always met to battle right there in the valley of Megiddo because it was a perfect place to have a fight and guess what's on the other side of the mountain at Megiddo you've got Jerusalem you've got the just small cities you've got the Sea of Galilee so and that was a trade route by the way coming out of the north going all the way down to Egypt was the valley of Megiddo and so they would meet there and that's where they were fighting every time they would have a battle and this went on for 200 years they would completely decimate the place. And then they would fight and kill, and then they would, their armies would pack up and go back. And so there's Israel again with all this, all this carnage on their hands. This time in the life of Israel is almost like the tribulation days are going to be. Where is God with Israel? Well, they've abandoned God. But there's still that remnant, and out of all of this, the Messiah would come, the Lord Jesus. Even with all the Roman things that are going on, you got the Maccabees, you got all of this stuff going on, and Rome is, is in charge, and the Maccabees are going to rebel, you got the Zealots, you've got all this stuff, and you know this about Bible history. All of this stuff is going on, and still out of all of that, God would choose a teenager by the name of Mary and an older man by the name of Joseph, and the Christ child would be born. With all of this stuff going on. So what's the hope here? Why does God allow Israel to suffer? Why is it so difficult for Israel today? Why does everybody hate Israel? When the Messiah came the first time, listen, he said to his people in, in John 5, 40, listen to this, John 5, 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus said, but you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. Listen to Luke 23, 28. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say, To the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Talking about the Lord Jesus. This is on his way, to, by the way, to his crucifixion. Romans 10.21. Listen, listen to what the Bible says. Romans 10.21. But Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Isaiah said that, by the way, 700 years before Christ. And still Israel, the nation, has not yet turned back to God in faith. And that's the heartache. You say, well, David, I understand all the history, and I understand Israel is being disciplined and, and that God is, is purging them, and, and, and God continues. He blesses them, but then he disciplines them. Read, the Rome, read Psalms, uh, good night, 106. Read Psalm 78. I mean, it's a history. It's just like the cycle keeps going and going and going. But then you have to be honest. Even with America, that the suffering that God is allowing the nation of Israel to go through, what God is allowing even the United States of America to go through, it's a gracious suffering. So how can that be? 
Although God has every right to forget Israel because they have forgotten him, he doesn't. Why? God's going to keep his word. So we, the church, the remnant, if you please, we are going to continue to trust God that God is going to honor his word. Like in Peter, it's not God's will that any person perish. So the people that you see doing things and, and the, the leaders that are around the world and China and, and, and Putin and all this stuff going on, God, God wants to save them. God doesn't say, I'm, I'm going to throw these away and I'm, I'm, I'm going to bless these. No, he doesn't even do it with his own children. You remember Hebrews 5, 8? Though he were a son, talking about Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he what? Suffered. See, we have to be careful. If you have this picture of God, that God is, is kind and, and, you know, he's, he's a grandfatherly type. He sits up in heaven in a rocking chair and he winks at our sin and he wants to take care of us and, and he gives us little things. No, 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 no. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is holy. He's just. He's righteous. And God will keep his word. As painful as it may be for us, whether it's suffering, whether you say, yeah, but I'm saved and I'm not being bad. We are suffering because we live in a sin-cursed world. That's why we have to go to the doctors. That's why we have things. That's why we have these tragedies in our, in our, in our lives. And that's why we see stuff happening. It just doesn't make any sense. That's why watching the news at night and you see all this going on. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the human race. Those are people. They have souls. And you see all of this just going on and on. And you hear about all these other things. I mean, it ought to break our Christian hearts that this stuff is happening. But we are reaping what we have sown. And the nation of Israel is reaping what they have sown. God has every right to say because of your harlotries and your incessant disobedience. He says, I will what? I, sh I should just forget you. Listen to Daniel eleven thirty five. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time. 35, he's talking about how that uh, there, there's, in the Jewish in Jerusalem, he said, some of them are going to fall. He said, but there's a reason for that, to refine them, to purify them. He's talking about the nation and to make them white, make them righteous until the time of the end because it's still for the appointed time. God says, listen, everything is still under control. God says, I still have everything. I know what's going on. I know why it's going on. What did Job say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I, I know people have a hard time with that. I say, why would God do that to Job? And, and I say, I'm not being cute. I say, well, why wouldn't he do that to Job? So well, why does God allow people to suffer? There's a reason for that. Why? Because there's glory in it for him. Does that seem selfish? You don't understand the purposes of God. Do you understand the, the ultimate purpose of God? I was sharing with a man just the other day. And uh, he's in a difficult place. And I said, now remember the promise. So for me, lives Christ and dies gain. He said, yes. I said, so you know what that means? He says, yeah, either way we go, we win. Folks, this is not all that there is in life. We think there is. So we're going to put all of, our, all of our stuff here. And we're counting on this. And we want this to happen. And all. You know what? God wants us to look up to him as followers of Christ. And we need to trust him and believe him. It's not about stuff. It's not about things. It's not about being happy. It's about being holy. And it means being a light so that others can see the difference in us. Why? Because eternity is for a long, long time. That's why. Isaiah 55, 11, my ways, God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His ways are deeper than our ways. Listen to Luke chapter 23, verse 28. I already read this, but I want to read it again. But Jesus turning to them said, daughters of Jerusalem, he's, he's carrying the cross, he's going to Calvary. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep for yourselves and for your children. The time will come when all of Israel will be saved. The time will come when Jesus comes back. The Antichrist thinks he can, he can fix the world's issues. It's not going to happen. Not until the Prince of Peace comes. And that is the great promise. God has given this vision to Daniel. And if you still got your Bibles up, look at, look at chapter 12 of Daniel, verse 1. 
And at that time, talking about this is the end time, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time and all that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. So here's the solace. Daniel wrote this 2,500 years ago. You're, you're, a, you know, you're a believing Jew, a Messianic Jew. You're in, living in Israel, and you read this verse. You say, you know what? God has given us our own personal angel. His name is Michael, the archangel. He's watching over us. And it says here that the time's going to come, and it's, it's not going to be good. But it, we shall be delivered. Everyone whose name is found written in the book. It's all about Christ. So that's the promise. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're looking for. There's coming a day when God shall help them to gain the victory. Let me close with Zechariah chapter 12, and I'll close with this. Zechariah 12, 10. You know, you, you hear all that I'm saying, and it sounds so negative, it sounds bad. You say, well, well, God's just being mean. No, 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 God's being just and holy. Look in verse 10, chapter 12 of Zechariah. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. The nation crucified Christ 2,000, 2,500 years ago. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Verse 11, In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives. He said, why is he, why is he all this mourning? You know what they're mourning for? Because when they see Jesus, they will see the one whom they have pierced. And then they will realize that this was the Messiah that God had sent them to help them, listen, to pay their sin debt in full and be their Messiah. And they will mourn over the fact that they had missed it all these years. All these years. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Zechariah. And that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And then he goes on and God says, I'm going to clean the land. I'm going to purge the land. God says, and this is incredible, as, 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 as disobedient and as idolatrous as the nation of Israel has been, as disobedient and as idolatrous as the whole world has been, God Almighty, listen, he still wants to do what? He wants to save us. He wants to cleanse our land, and God wants to love us, and God wants to bless us. After all that we've done and all that we've said and how much hatred and all this, God says, I still want to bless you. I want to save you. I want to pay your sin debt. I want to give you everything that you need in Christ. In Christ. They will be a redeemed nation. And one day... Christ will rule and reign on the earth. Sometimes we come to Scripture, it's hard, and we read it, and you go, that just doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem fair. And if I stood up here for another hour, and I, I tried to explain it more and more and more, you know, it's, it's like some of you are going to get stuck on the fact that I can't believe God would be so mean. He's not mean. Everything God does, there's a, there's a purpose behind it. Everything God does, there's a reason for it. Every, everything, everything, everything. I used to think, you know, my, my dad got saved when he was 54. And by the time he was 56, he had, he had full-blown Alzheimer's. And, you know, I had people say, you know, man, what a shame. It was too bad your dad didn't get saved. I said, no, you're missing the whole picture. He got saved. He got saved. He said, yeah, but I said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't get on the woulda, coulda, shouldas. He got saved, and, you know, he's in heaven now because he passed away when he was 64. The, the point is he got saved. You know what? When we get to heaven, it's not going to say, you know, I wish I'd have gotten saved when I was this. I wish I got saved when I was two months old, but I didn't. I didn't get saved when I was 22. But the point is, I got saved. I got saved. And everybody gets the same reward. Everlasting life. Forgiveness of sin. No matter how hard or how difficult or how persecuted or, or how, whatever. The point is salvation. That speaks of eternity. We, we've got to be careful of being stuck here and say, well, you know, this could have been this, and this could have been that. Well, you know, that's, but what, it's salvation, eternity is what's important. Nothing else. If we get to heaven, it's not going to matter how many surgeries you had, how many heartaches you had, how many tragedies you went through. What's going to matter is, is that you're saved and you know Jesus as your Savior. 
And you'll see the King of Kings. And I promise you, it's going to be such a glorious moment that you're going to forget about everything behind you. All the suffering. All the suffering. I said this a long time ago. What's the only thing in heaven that's going to be made by the hands of man? What's the only thing? The scars on the hand of Jesus. Those are ours, by the way. They're ours. Let me pray with you real quick. Father, thank you for this privilege of being able to share your word with people who want to hear it, people who love to hear it. It tells us about you. Lord, it shows us a side of you that maybe we've, we've never noticed, we've never thought of. God, you are so incredible. You're incredible in your patience and your gentleness. But Lord, as you reveal yourself to us, Lord, there's sometimes it, it's, it's almost maddening because I, I just I can't grasp it it doesn't make sense and so then Lord I have to meditate I have to have a sea law I have to think about it and I have to allow the Spirit of God to make the application to my own life Lord this is this is not a drive-through Bible lesson no Lord this is something that we need to think through with your word we, we have nothing else to measure it with we have we must stay with your word and in your word and trust the teacher of the word, the spirit of God to show us so that we can understand. We must pray about it. It took Daniel three weeks on his face, mourning, mourning over his sinfulness, hurting over what he, what he sees and why the people aren't going back. And there was a supernatural warfare going on above him. And he didn't know that. All he knew was he had a lot of questions and there's not a lot of answers. But Lord, he stayed with you. And then you came and you revealed to him. And Lord, it's not what he wanted to hear. But you showed him the truth about what's going to happen with the whole nation of Israel. Lord, we want those quick answers. We want those fast blessings. Are we willing to agonize and wait? Knowing, Lord, all that's going on around us. And Lord, that doesn't make us special. It just makes us your children who want to know. I pray tonight we would find encouragement, the example of Daniel, the battle that's fought around him and over him, and how that Daniel was satisfied because Daniel knew God and God knew Daniel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I ask God's blessings on you, and we'll see you Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much.